Okay, I'm going to introduce our presenter today. Um, her name is Tanya Stilson. She's a longtime entrepreneur in southern Alberta. She's uh, neither a lawyer or a physician, but she shares the view of her father, John Warren, that people can plan for a good death. And she's hoping that sharing her personal story will provide people with information on the choices that are available in Canada for a good death. And in the interest of full disclosure, I want to say that I knew John well. He was a, uh, a friend of SACPA, and he did present to SACPA um, a few times on this subject of dying with dignity. And it was John that inspired a small group of people in the community, including myself and several who are here today, uh, to, to gather together in 2013 and work towards uh, legalizing medical aid in dying in Canada. And John was a wonderful individual, and I'm the community was, was benefited a lot from his life and his work. So Tanya, we look forward to hearing your perspectives of a daughter on uh, medical assistance in dying. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Knut. I'm a little taller than Cheryl. Uh, thank you, everyone. Wow, what a great turnout today. I was a little worried when the uh, weather looked like it did, so I, uh, I thought I'd bring my own sunshine today and just uh, and share with you a bit of my story. So thank you again for showing up. I'd like to start today with the same question that my dad started with in 2011 when he presented to SAPCA on the topic, are you in favor of medical assistance in dying? So the question he asked, and please raise your hand if you agree, is are, how many of you think you are going to die? <laughs> All right, we have a premise to continue. Excellent. Now, let me add a couple of my own questions. How many of you have heard of medical assistance in dying? Excellent. And how many of you who know somebody who has made this choice? Great. Excellent. Oh, I love this room already. <laughs> Thank you. My hope is that by sharing my story, I can provide some insight today that you will all find valuable. My dad is John Warren, and I am the youngest of his three daughters. Dad was instrumental in helping Canadians to be able to have the choice of a dignified, compassionate, and empowering death through medical assistance in dying, or MAID. And when the time came, he was able to make the choice for himself. This is my daughter's perspective of our family's journey. Today I will share with you Dad's pain journey since 2010, his involvement with the organization Dying with Dignity, the current profile of MAID recipients, the changes that occurred in March of 2021 and the Track 2 option, our process from the application onwards, the hard bits and the lovely bits, and my recommendations and learning. My dad lived as he died, with strength, conviction, purpose, and love. He had compassion for himself and others, and a deep dignity and knowingness of himself. He lived his life to the very fullest. He had an insatiable desire to learn and to live a purposeful life. Together with my mom, they traveled the world and gave back generously. He loved many things, including Mexican sunsets, a good book, soulful jazz, long hikes, and intelligent conversation, but most of all, his wife and his family. Dad wrote a letter to the editor of the Lethbridge Herald that he had published after his scheduled death on January 4th. And the last sentence read, I'm just a guy trying to get people to fear death less and love life more. Dad often spoke that like most good things in life, a good death is worth thinking and talking about. So as much as I could speak about how much he embraced life, today I will focus on how he equally approached his passing with a deep knowingness of himself and our family. 
I called it his Tourette's, as he would twitch so violently in pain and then let out a few choice swear words. He said the numbness was like wearing concrete ski boots and the pain was like being stabbed with hot razor blades. There was no rhyme or reason to the pain. Sometimes it was held at bay, sometimes it was only at night, and then the beast kept coming. Dad was a very active guy, and his health was something that he deeply valued. He played squash until his 70s, hiked all over Glacier and Waterton, and golfed two to three times a week after he retired. He had a bit of a bump with prostate cancer at age 65, and he and Mom traveled to Atlanta where he received brachiotherapy. The results were tremendously successful. Then at age 70, he contracted hepatitis B. We believe he contracted this from dental work he had done in Mexico. He described the day of July 15, 2010 in his book, Letters to My Family, as follows. We were playing golf with our regular group of friends when without warning on the 16th hole, I felt weak and my hands hurt when I hit the ball. I managed to finish the round and as usual, had a beer and ate supper. By the time we left, my hands and feet were so swollen that Barbara, my mom, had to drive us home. His liver quickly started shutting down, he lost his mobility, and he was very, very ill. Dad told the story many times that it was at this point that he began to think about people's ability, or lack thereof, to choose how and when their death happens. He vowed that he would never not have control over his own death again. He believed in choice. The last chance to save his life from hepatitis B was through plasma phoresis, which he received in Calgary four months later. The blood plasma is removed from the body, separated and transferred back into the bloodstream. For some unknown reason, the procedure caused him great pain. However, he started to recover immediately, and by the end of that December, he was out of the wheelchair and we brought him home. We would quickly learn, though, that there was damage to his immune system, which left him with peripheral neuropathy, a condition that caused constant numb and painness to varying degrees. <clears throat> oh, but he tried it all. He tried everything that he and our family could think of for pain relief. Believe me, you don't want to be our family project. Or, or maybe you do. From physical therapy to vibration machines to acupuncture and heated socks and anything online. From chiropractic courses and even stem cell therapy at significant investment, which helped for a bit. But eventually, like everything else, it wore off. He had a long list of pain specialists and, of course, his ongoing and escalating pain meds. In addition to his increasing pain, his lifestyle, social network, and meaningful activity began to decline. And over time, his full day hikes became walks in the coolies, which became jaunts around Henderson Lake. And last summer, he was struggling to walk for barely 15 minutes, and his balance was getting worse. Now you'll see that he's wearing the same shirt often in these pictures. He was a total minimalist, and this was his hiking shirt on the, on the right there that he wore for 30 years. <laughs> it's tucked under my mom's pillows these days. As I said, Dad believed people should never lack control over their own death, and nearly two years later in the spring of 2012, he was still in debilitating pain. He read an article about the organization Dying with Dignity, traveled to a seminar in Vancouver where he met the CEO, and later that summer he was elected to become the Vice President of the National Board. And for four years he threw himself into researching, presenting, and writing about Dying with Dignity, and was part of the team that fought hard to change the law in Canada, as Cheryl referred to. In 2015, the Supreme Court agreed and declared that the criminal code would need to change to satisfy the Canadian Charter of Rights. They had won. Dad resigned that fall with the satisfaction that things were moving forward. He said it was one of the most gratifying things he had ever done. The new law was created in 2016 and Canadians now had choice. My dad's passion for dying with dignity was regular dinner conversation for years, even prior to being on the board. It was an open and required topic. Movies were strongly suggested, articles were sent, and books which he read and underlined were passed along for some of us to read. 
For those who knew him, you would know him to be an extremely articulate and persuasive man. He was strong in his opinions, and there was nothing he was more resolute about. It was the choice he wanted Canadians to have, the choice of a, signi a dignified and compassionate death. What they did with that choice was then up to them. So, as his family, knowing his belief was so strong, when the conversation changed to his choice and his dignified death, we were united in our support for him. So let's take a quick look at who's been using MAID since that time. So since 2016, oh, I have to read it. Since 2016, the total MAID-related deaths are 31,664. Every year at the end of the year, they publish a report. In December 2021, the statistics are as follows. 3.3% of all deaths now involve MAID. 52% uh, are men, 48% are women, and the average age is 76 years. Most often, the underlying condition is terminal cancer at 66%. 19% of cardiovascular conditions, then chronic re uh, respiratory conditions and neurological conditions. 81% of all requests now end in MAID. However, 13% of the people die prior, 4% are deemed ineligible, and 2% withdraw their application. And unlike it was in originally in 2016, 44% of MAID-related deaths now happen in the client's home. Now, two years ago, in March 2021, there were changes made to the law, and Bill C-7 was passed. What's important to note is that the eligibility criteria has not changed. All made applicants must have a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability. All made applicants must be in an advanced state of irreversible decline in capability and all must have an enduring and intolerable physical or psychological suffering that cannot be alleviated under condition that the person considers acceptable. You also must be 18, have Alberta health care, and of course it must be voluntary. Now what changed in March 2021 with Bill C-7 was that the eligibility was broadened and the requirement that the person's natural death must be reasonably foreseeable, that piece was removed. So in other words, the applicant no longer had to be terminal. Other changes to the original legislation were that for track one applicants, those who are terminal, two practitioners must confirm eligibility. And this is important, that the 10-day reflection period was eliminated as healthcare professionals and experts felt this reflection period often led to prolonged suffering, and that people who requested MAID do so after careful consideration. And finally, advanced consent, advanced consent can now only be used for Track 1 applicants under certain conditions. For Track 2 applicants, when the death is not naturally reasonably foreseeable, instead of a 10-day reflection period, which they eliminated for Track 1, they put in an eligibility requirement of 90 days to help ensure that all treatment options have been identified and explored. However, we found that even if no assessments are required or wanted, it cannot currently be shortened. It is both my dad's and my opinion that in the future this needs to be carefully reviewed. I would challenge the people who have applied for Track 2 have also done so with careful consideration, if not more so. My dad continued to write to organizations throughout his last few weeks to shed light on this subject and told them that he was reachable by email until January 3rd, the day prior. So, Dad. <laughs> Track 2 applicants also must have two mandatory assessments. The applicant must be informed of available supports, and you must have informed consent given a minimum of two times, typically verbal and written. And the percentage of the report of Track 2 made related deaths in 2021 is very small. It was only 219. So dad's not quite one in a million, but he's pretty close. So what's the process in Alberta? With a quick Google of medical assistance and dying in Alberta, you will be taken to the Alberta Health Service page, which provides a lot of great information for patients or family members, as well as frequently asked questions and data and statistics for those interested. Under the patient or family member areas is the record of request form which is the first step. 
It's a simple form, which I like. It's easier than doing your taxes. Uh, but if you have questions, you can reach out to HealthLink at 811 or there's an email directly to the MAID team. Now you must initial and sign the form in the presence of an independent witness who is at least 18, understands the nature of the request, is personally known to the applicant or has been provided proof of identity, and the witness cannot know or believe that they're a beneficiary under the applicant's will or would not have a financial or material benefit from the applicant's death. And they cannot be directly involved in providing health care services to the applicant. You can then either send or take the form to your doctor or nurse practitioner if they're willing to help, or you can send it via email to the main team or mail the form to Calgary. There's three main teams in Alberta that assist applicants across Alberta, one in northern, central, and southern Alberta, and they are a wonderful group of people. So Dad's process, he completed his application and had it witnessed by a friend on September 28th. He sent it in on October the 3rd, and his application was first read on October 5th, and this would become an important date later. Now, it may seem unusual to some of you, but after my, after my dad sent his application, he did what he and mom always did after Thanksgiving each year for the past 19 years. They headed to their place in Puerto Vallarta. So at this point, we didn't know that dad had applied. But we did know that the warmer climate and greater community of friends often made a positive difference for Dad. I have a copy of the email he sent to the main team in the evening after they arrived, which stated, made it to Puerto Vallarta and watched the sunset over the Pacific last night. Nice. And then as typical, he had several follow-up questions, including how would the main team communicate for the assessments? Would it be FaceTime, email, or phone? How long would the assessments take? He asked in reference paragraph 4 of section 10 and asked if that meant he would be able to die as of the 26th of December, plus or minus. He was a financial planner by trade. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I am the daughter. Uh, he also questioned where the legislation stated that he had to wait this 90 days and noted that section 13 stated that the legislation, quote unquote, does not have to have a specific timeline. And in typical fashion, he also asked how we could challenge this timeline. All three of us girls had dates to visit our parents over the winter months. We had no idea that things would change so rapidly for us all. Things go terribly wrong pretty quickly between October 16th and October 28th. Like many in Alberta, mom and dad lost their doctor last summer. They had a temporary solution, but their new doctor didn't ask dad any questions about his pain and only refilled his hefty pain medications. So when they returned to Puerto Vallarta, ooh, Puerto Vallarta, they both wanted a checkup with their regular doctor there. And dad wanted to discuss his increasing pain, lack of energy, and other concerns. The doctor suggested a new pain specialist who performed some tests and made significant changes to his medications. Dad was open to anything to alleviate his increasing pain. But the pain continued to increase at an alarming rate. Saturday, October 29th. Dad's pain is now excruciating and continuous. He tried to increase his pain meds back, but it doesn't work. And he also catches a bit of a bug. The time has come for him to make the choice that we knew he was likely going to get to at some point. But of course, it's still terribly shocking and difficult on us all, including Dad. We have a family call on Sunday, October 30th, and the decision is to come home immediately and to proceed with the made request. It's a heartbreaking day. I offer to help Dad in any way with the main process and assessments. And I believe this step of having someone work with the applicant and to be a buffer for others was good for our family. And I'm forever grateful for everyone allowing me to help dad in this role. We are unanimous in our desire to have a good death through maid. The alternative is unbearable. Thankfully, everyone in the family is supportive of his decision to exercise his choice, but it isn't easy. Tuesday, November 1st, 
Mom and Dad returned to Canada after saying their goodbyes to everyone in, in Mexico, which was very hard. They'd been there for 19 years. They stayed with my eldest sister and her family in Calgary, who were great hosts in a very difficult time. I work with the MAID team, who are wonderfully supportive, and the assessments are quickly scheduled. Thursday, November 3rd, Dad and I do the first assessment via Zoom together. It's difficult and emotional, but Dad does a tremendous job telling his story. I feel prepared, but perhaps uh, not ready, if that makes sense, as I support him and fill in any details that are relevant. Mom is beside him, but she is off camera. She is having a terrible time with her hearing aids, and it's tremendously stressful for her, as you can imagine. But she is very supportive. Dad has written his seven-page document of his history of pain. It's not necessary, it's just my dad, just so you know. Uh, which we sent to the assessor prior. She is kind and gentle and thorough. She deems the dad is approved for me, but is unsure if it will be track one or track two. And we request that the non-reasonably foreseeable bit be reviewed. He is, after all, above male life expectancy, and a 90-day wait period seems excessive, considering we've been on this journey for 12 years. It's an odd feeling, and every win feels like a loss in some ways. I remember after the call that Dad tells me I'm very good at this stuff. I tell him it's good genes. He says he's addicted to compliments. There's always some lightness in what we're trying to do. Friday, November 4th, Mom and Dad come back to Lethbridge. We all attempt to make life somewhat normal, like my husband bringing a very big bag of snacks. His love language is food. We make arrangements for meals to be brought in or dropped off and book evenings together. Everyone balances time and rest, and there's great generosity and grace with one another, and life feels surreal. Monday, November 7th, Mom, Dad, and I receive a phone call from the first assessor, and we are approved for track one, which means a quick timeline and the end of suffering for Dad. We know we still have the second assessment on the Thursday, but we are confident, likely overconfident. Dad knows the assessor from his work with Dying with Dignity, and we feel she will be empathetic. We make final plans for his green burial, his celebration of life, and get grandchildren say their final goodbyes. We confirm his details for a scheduled date of Tuesday, November 15th. Everything is put in place. Thursday, November 10th. Mom, Dad, and I are in person at their condo, and Dad is passionate about the topic and holds court. Although Dad and the assessor know each other, there is little small talk. She asks if he is depressed. He says no. She offers to connect him to counseling. She asks if he's thought about the family. He chokes up. Of course he has. She asks about additional treatment, and he says he has tried everything. She shocks us by saying he meets eligibility, but that he must wait 90 days from the first reading of the application, which was October 5th. We are devastated, and quite frankly, frustrated and shocked, and it means facing Christmas. We requ request a third assessor immediately. This is one of the worst days for me. Tuesday, November 15th, Maid arranges a third assessment for the following Tuesday. She's a wonderful person from Medicine Hat who is a compassionate listener. She's on Zoom. Mom shares her experience with watching Dad's pain. After all, spouses see more than anyone else. Dad reiterates that he clearly meets all of the eligibility. He steadfastly tells the assessor that this is not who I am. She approves him for MAID, and then patiently stresses the fact that it will have to be under track two, as his death is not a reasonably foreseeable natural death. We need to follow the process, as this is, after all, under the criminal code rather than health. Dad understands, not necessarily agrees, but it is the way the current legislation is written. We breathe a sigh of relief and know that this part of the process is over. He will have a good death. I remember doing a little selfish happy dance in the bathroom before we were phoned the rest of the family. We had more time. We cancel his final arrangements and find peace and joy in the fact that we have 51 more days together. 
the hard bits. My mom and dad have been together. They would have been married 60 years in, in March, and they met when they were 13 and 14. That's hard. Waiting for the actual date was hard, which came on November 28th, my eldest sister's birthday. Sharing that date with mom and dad. Typically, Maid would do this directly, but I was still being the buffer. And then the three of us discussed the best time of day. Mom picked the morning, which I'm grateful for. Trying to explain to friends, work, and really society when so little is known about track two especially. There wasn't really language about what we were all facing. My experience with Sharon's dad's choice was gracefully accepted. My one sister and my mom had some rough responses from some folks, which were hurtful and difficult. Going through all the regular things that the Christmas season brings, holiday parties, socializing with friends, Christmas concert, etc. We navigated these things carefully and gracefully for the most part. I tried hard not to do the countdown of days. Other family members were very aware, and this was just part of their process. Looking back now, there was a weird sense of being in a fog of grief, but then having the person still alongside with us. My middle wit sister went through all of the things you would typically take care of after death, filling out the funeral forms, eliminating monthly subscriptions, and changing bank accounts. And then dad tagged along. The anticipation of Christmas, New Year's, and of course the date of January 4th. And the continual grief for dad, mom, our spouses, the grandchildren, friends, and all of us. We were living it together, but it was a lot to walk through. Oh my God, that fish cracks me up every time. Um, my husband told my dad to make a face like a bear. I'm not sure why, but it still makes, it just brings me joy. I jokingly would call dad or visit him every day and tell him I've had my awkward question of the day. He was so terribly patient and knew that in the end it would be helpful to mom and the family. Mom requested no surprises on that day, which was very wise. I asked Maid every possible question I could and I shared the answers with the family, including Dad. We ran the scenarios and did mental walkthroughs of the day prior and the day of. Mom, Dad, and I met with Cornerstone and planned out Dad's green burial. We openly talked about how would we schedule the days before and what did everyone feel they needed? What did Mom need and what did Dad need at this point? We made the decision that it would happen at their home, but we planned the specific room Dad wanted the living room, but he lost out on that vote. We discussed who would be in the bedroom and chose that it would just be the five of us Warrens. We planned where the spouses would be, which would just be outside of their condo in a little sitting area. We talked about the exact process and learned that it was a series of injections and what each one did. The first would put him into a sleep state, the next would numb his vein, the next three would be large 40cc syringes and would slow everything to a stop. And the last would ensure that there was no involuntary movements afterwards. And as tough as it was to know, and then tell Dad, I'm glad that we were all very prepared. We talked about what would happen afterwards. When would the grandchildren arrive? And if you know my family at all, we discussed what and when we would eat. Now, Dad also weighed in on this topic and we found the humor in his thoughts. And again, he was overruled. I mean, it was a bit much. Hmm, the lovely bits and things shared. One of the most important things I want to share today is all the gifts and peace that this experience brings. We focused on the love and not the loss. We had special one-on-one -on -one time or couple time as we needed. We were able to tell him how much we loved him and he us. There was nothing left unsaid and no regrets if you took the opportunity. He was able to say his fond farewells to many. There was lots of conversations, emails, hugs, and we called it liquid love. There was peace in the knowingness that no one was going to miss his passing. He was able to tie up any pieces that he felt were needed to support mom going forward. 
and we saw that he was at complete peace with his decision and had no fear of death. He knew in time, as hard as it would be, that we would all heal. He, nor my mom, nor any of us girls, ever wavered. We all believed strongly in the option of choice and supported him in his things shared. He also found great joy in sharing many things over the last few weeks. He shared a book that he wrote when he was 78 entitled Letters to My Family. And he chose another book from his personal library and wrote a beautiful inscription for every family member. He shared his list of his favorite books and his music library with me, two loves we both share. And he was able to give some chosen possessions. For me, it was his Norwegian sweater which he bought on the first holiday he took with my mom in 1959 and knew then that they would spend the rest of their lives together. He wore it forever, including this picture of us in 1971, and now I get to. And then we had our last Christmas. Wednesday, January 4th. Respectfully, I will keep some of these details private. But I will tell you that I woke up that morning with a deep sense of peace. When we arrived, Dad was playing Wordle and sitting by the window. Mom was wearing a bright red dress. We scheduled the maid team for the morning, which I'm grateful for. The nurse arrived and put in the intravenous picks. The processor, who was also our first assessor, arrived 30 minutes later with her briefcase of medications along with a nursing student. Our spouses said goodbye and left the condo to sit in the sitting area just outside of it. And our family was asked to share our experience with the May team and we chatted for some time. It was perfect for us. The processor then asked Dad for written consent. It could have been in private, but he asked to do it in front of us all. Then he and mom walked hand in hand into the bedroom and we followed. We all got settled and then she asked for consent again. The process took about 10 minutes. It was peaceful, compassionate, and of course heartbreaking. Maid finalized the paperwork and the funeral home was called. <coughs> My learnings. Things I learned about dad and his choice. I feel so proud of the work he did for Canadians and for people's right to choose. I am happy that in the end he was able to walk down this path for himself. I am thankful for the continuous conversations about his view on a good death long before we were all faced with it, for both his sake and ours. I can't imagine his passing any other way. His choice was a total act of knowingness, bravery, compassion, and empowerment. And these things helped me tremendously. I also learned a lot about myself. I learned that when you need to tell people when you're not OK and to ask or seek help when you need it. Now, I was quite surprised to learn that most people find death a difficult conversation. And we need to normalize this much more in our society. I learned that a scheduled death, when it's foreseeable, such as terminal cancer, is somehow more understandable and almost acceptable. For some reason, a non-foreseeable natural death that meets all the criteria is harder for people. So that means there's work to be done. So presentations and conversations like this are very important. Being real and authentic, regardless of the emotion, is leadership. And I learned that a good death and a well-planned death matters. A few recommendations. We plan for everything else in our life. Plan for your death, too. You need to talk about death and dying, if not for your peace of mind, then for others as well. Regardless of if it is a maid scenario or a healthcare crisis, have a family support person or a buffer who can ask the hard and potentially awkward questions. It's not an easy role, but it does make the path smoother for all. A scheduled death is a different experience, and track two is different yet again. Don't miss the opportunities to embrace the pure beauty of it all. In grief, whether it is before, during, or after a person's passing, don't ask people what they need. The onus can't be on them. Just try something. 
anything. Throughout our lives, being in relationship with others, we need to be supportive of our individual choices. Choosing a medically assisted death is a brave, empowering, and peaceful choice. Be supportive, it's a great act of love. Maybe the very greatest. I am extremely proud of how our entire family navigated and support, supported one another, and I know Dad was too. So in conclusion, I hope this has helped you to understand the importance of a good death. And like my dad said, let's try and be people who help others fear death less and love life more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, truly. I will say as we move to questions that I am very comfortable. Like, please ask me if I can ask the awkward questions and present them to my dad. Most certainly you can ask me the awkward questions. If it's so awkward that I'm uncomfortable answering, I'll tell you. So please, I believe this is a safe place. It's very important to me that we have an open conversation, so fire away. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was uh, beautiful and such a great tribute to your father. All right, we're ready for questions, um, and I'll invite people to line up along the wall. Uh, please ask your questions respectfully, and no, don't be too long-winded in your lead-up to the question. Uh, state your name, um, and uh, we then encourage you to return to your seat. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I don't really have a question, but I have a tribute to your mom. Uh, Barbara Warren is one of the raging grannies, and she would Zoom from Puerto Vallarta when we couldn't do much else but Zoom. Uh, and I think the last time I heard from Barbara was right after January 4th, and she posted on the Raging Granny's Facebook that John didn't tell her she was writing that let he was writing that letter to the Lethbridge Herald. So I think Lethbridge should be very proud of your dad. It was beautiful. And I can't wait for Barbara to be back raging. <laughs> Thank you again to all your family for telling the journey. You're Thank you. My name is Klaus Jericho. Uh, I don't know how I will respond, so take care. Um, Tonya, awesome. John would be John would be very proud of you. Very proud. I've known the family for a long time, and I've known John for a long time. John was a very factual person, and that's why we got along so well. Um, the only emotional comment I got from him <coughs> in our email communications at the end, he said, it was so, <laughs> do something about this show. <laughs> Give me a hug. <laughs> uh, uh, it was so good to be loved by the family. Uh, he, he was remarkable in his approach to life. And when I, uh, well, when I chose my profession, I wanted to know about life. And then when I retired, I thought to myself, now I'm really going to go at it. Because when you're in a profession, you're sort of in the channel. So then I want to diversify myself. And experience with the Warren family <coughs> was an integral part of this diversification and learning about life. 
Thank you, warm family. For, for teaching me about life. That's why you got a standing ovation. <laughs> I'm Ian Hurdle. Um, I was a doctor for a great many years. And in my profession, for many years, I felt trapped. I would have somebody lying in a bed, and if they turned over, their bones would break. They didn't even need to be lifted. You could have people that none of our pain medications would touch, and they were given fantastic doses. Now, those people only had some ways out. The people on dialysis would stop doing it. Some people would clench their mouth and never take another morsel, and they would die. Then there was suicide. Um, You'd have people with 75% burns on their body. <coughs> and they really didn't need to be here. What's happened now is fantastic for our country. The third generation of doctors in my family, uh, one of them, she's very active and made, and I've heard from a lot of people that she's involved with that it was wonderful. And I think you lucked out and I think your perseverance of your dad was incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Knut Peterson, and Tanya, I actually have a question for you, but before that, I will pay tribute to your dad because he was, as chair of SACPA at the time, he came and asked me if I thought it would be appropriate to have a SACPA session on the topic. And I didn't know much about things, so I had a good conversation with them, and I said, absolutely, that would be, that would be really, I'd be really proud to uh, host a session. As a dictator of SACPA, I said, that's what I said, but it, it was obviously a, a, a board decision, but... And then down the road, he uh, spoke at length to me about starting up a SACPA session in Mexico, starting up a SACPA group based on the SACPA model. And I don't know how well it went, but that is my question to you. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Canoe. Uh, yeah, I, uh, first of all, I will say this, this group was very important to Dad, and how lovely it is that I can go back and hear him you know, talk about milestones of misery as only my dad would in his presentation, but it's very nice to be able to uh, hear his voice and to have his opinions uh, prior to the legislation passing and then afterwards as well. So uh, I think he did two presentations here, and then there was a panel discussion at the library, from what I remember. Uh, yeah, he and Mom were, were involved. Uh, so I'm still challenged with the present and past tense, uh, with a group called Contemplative Sundays in Puerto Vallarta. And so I would say that that is very similar to this group. Uh, I will also share that my, so my mom and dad had the condo. Uh, my mom, when they came home in October, said she's never going back there. That was their place. And she decided to go back in May, uh, sorry, in March. So my middle sister was going down. Uh, mom went with Pauline and Troy, and then mom stayed for two weeks by herself. And so she will go back to Puerto Vallarta again in the fall, just as she always did with dad, and join Contemplative Sundays. Uh, I have told her that if she wants to do a presentation, she's very open about talking about her experience as a spouse. 
Um, respectfully, I told her she couldn't come today. <laughs> uh, it, it's hard enough to walk through the story about my dad without staring down the eyes of my mother. Um, but I did tell her that when we go back to Puerto Vallarta, when we can go with my husband and I go and visit next January, that I uh, would do a presentation with her at Contemplative Sundays in Puerto Vallarta. So that's uh, up to her. Yeah. Thanks, Kennedy, for the question. My name is Mark Gettel. Now, many of our seniors' homes are run, uh, public fun publicly funded seniors' homes are run by religious organizations. And I understand that if you want MAID in one of those organizations, this has been maybe your home for many years, but you are asked to leave the, uh, the, or the uh, seniors' home to have MAID outside. Basically, you're rolled out onto the sidewalk, and I think an ambulance has to take you to a park or somewhere. So is this being legally challenged? I mean, these are publicly funded institutions that are preventing MAID. Is MAID addressing this? Yeah, yeah good, good question. Um, you know, my dad self-proclaimed, quote unquote, he loved to call himself a raging atheist. I'm not sure about the raging part, but it, maybe it's raging grannies. Uh, so he always had a very interesting opinion about what religion and made the lines of what that was. And I think we've seen things change over time. I believe that this is less and less of a religious issue. So my hope, Mark, is that these things continue to open up. I'm not sure that's not correct about how uh, Covenant Health, et cetera, runs their organization, but I can't speak to it directly. I haven't you know, been in the facility um, but I do believe that things are opening up for, you know, freedom of religious choice is really what, you know, Dad often talked, he might be a raging atheist, but he believes in, in religious choice. So, um, you know, I will, I will share that some of the hardest times for mom and my middle sister were some strong opinions on that side. Um, so I think there's still going to be challenges, uh, but it's, to me, it's just the conversation about choice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tanya, very much for your, your talk. Um, um, I'm going to get emotional, too. I'm Mary Shillington, and I worked for years in, at Lethbridge Family Services with people who were grieving. And I think of some of those people who didn't have a good family support. And like, you're, you were fortunate you had a family who took you in your arms, and, and you worked together. Now, for some of the people, that had no, no or little family support, and this could possibly be an option, but what happens for them yeah. if there's no that clear support? Yeah. Uh, have you any suggestions for how we can help that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks Mary. Oh, she's a tiny little one. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Mary. Yeah, I can, I can tell you that our experience with MAID was very good, and they were very um, open about other families that weren't all on the same page. Uh, I do know of other families where uh, a parent has passed and the rest of the family wasn't informed. I know of several situations where it's almost, um, you know, this, I hate to say it, but this dirty little secret that's happening. Um, and I think that that's, I think that's really unfortunate. I would say in our family, um, you know, many of you know my dad, so you know you're either on his bus or you're off the bus. Um, but he was very strong in his opinions. But but he also had the conversation early, right? It's like don't have the conversation where you're faced with a terminal illness. That's really hard for for families to get their head around. If you're of healthy mind and body now, you need to have those conversations way early. You need to have those conversations on both sides. I think people of my generation need to have those conversations with their parents. And I think sometimes we don't believe that we should. We believe that somehow if we talk about our parents' death, it won't happen. Like, as my dad said, like, the leaves on the trees are yellow. I don't know what people think is going to happen here. <laughs> so, you know, we need to talk about our parents' passing. And parents, you need to talk to your children your adult children about your passing and what you want. I mean, my parents, for as long back as I can remember when they traveled, I mean, I was, 
I was like 16, 17, so they were like 45. There's a manila envelope on the table, kitchen table, that said in case of death. I like, that's the point. We're all going to die, so it's better that we all know what we want. That's the point of a good death. That's the point of a planned death. If you sneak up on those conversations and now you're having the conversation with your terminal parent, that's a terrible time. That's a terrible time to try and layer in this conversation. So I would say, you know, the maid support team was wonderful. They told us that they've been in situations where a maid death is happening and they've had to, you know, literally ask family members to leave the room. So we were lucky, uh, but have the conversation, as with most good things in life, have the conversation often and frequent and lean in and don't be afraid of having those, those conversations. You need to. I, I can share the story with my dad had a personal directive. There's three girls and we had to answer the questions, not how we would answer the questions, but what would dad like. And what dad wants can be completely different than what mom wants. They support each other though, but individual choice, autonomy. Anyways, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> we have two more questioners and then I, we won't have time for any more. Oh. Oh. Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yvonne Jones. And I, my question is about all those poor elderly people who have mental issues like Alzheimer's and stuff and their family, yep. they're like vegetables and their family is just so distraught and yet they can't do anything. That's right. Well, they can. Being okay, yeah. well what do they yeah, do? Yeah, 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 my yeah, my question sure. is yeah. what can they do? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Alzheimer's is a cognitive issue, right? So as you saw in some of the statistics, you can apply for a maid uh, with Alzheimer's as cognitive. Not the person. What not the not the person. So again, a good death. Like plan early. You need to have those conversations early. So if you are unable to communicate and your capability, mental capability, isn't there, then no, the it's yeah. the ship has sailed, so to speak. Yeah, yeah that's unfortunate. So. If you plan earlier, uh, you can also, because that will deem, be deemed as track one, you can also, which I like about track one versus track two, you can also have a waiver of consent. So you can apply, you can get a, the two assessments done, they say it meets the criteria of irreversible and all of the things, and then you can have a waiver of consent, so then if your Alzheimer uh, disease continues on, you can still have the waiver of consent and exercise your choice. Your family can exercise that choice for you. So it's only Alzheimer's? Uh, I don't want to speak specifically to when the waiver of consent, but it does only fall under track one. It is one of dad's greatest fear. He always worried he was going to slip and fall out of the you know bathtub because if he lost the ability of, of mental capability, he couldn't have had the waiver of consent. So currently waiver of consent is only on track one, but that's the, that's the next thing happening with dying with the dignity is they are really trying to push for waiver of consent so all of us can make the choice and have that waiver part of our personal directive. Yeah. Uh, that exactly fits in with what I was going to talk about because my husband didn't, but we had no idea that he was going to get dementia and the, it was just a long and very painful death and I know darn well he would have liked to have been put out of it but the, when I came back from BC where, where he passed away I joined Dying with Dignity in Lethbridge and for two years, there was quite an active group here, but I've written to the head office and said, who's in charge of the chapter now? And my, I've got no reply. It doesn't seem as though we have a chapter. Can you address that at all? And what is your name? Oh, I'm sorry, Patricia Buswell. Okay, thanks, Patricia. <coughs> Yeah, I think it's interesting because Dad and I did have a conversation about the Lethbridge chapter because if you go on the national page, and I, I left some handouts for people to be able to look at, but the Lethbridge story is actually, I, I swear it's probably to, to do with Dad, but the Lethbridge story is actually eliminated from the whole story of dying with dignity in Canada because I know the Lethbridge chapter went out and helped the Calgary group and all sorts of other groups. Um, so I'm not, I, yeah, maybe, maybe Cheryl, you can speak more to what happened to the Lethbridge group and, and where people are at with that. 
I don't know if this is allowed that you can ask the moderator oh, a question. <laughs> I'm not a real follower either. Well, there are uh, members of that, leading members of that chapter here, like David Amy's, yeah. and Bev Potter is here, Norma Bolton. Who am I missing? Um, so for five years, we we did were very active, mm -hmm. and. Um, from 2013 is when we started, and um, 2016 the legislation passed, and so we we thought, well, we've achieved the main goal that we s were set out, and then what was our next challenge? And I we did start to work on um, making sure uh, that all um, medical facilities in Lethbridge, like St. Martha's, um, or St. Mike's would um, allow medical aid in dying because we felt that is a legal issue that should be challenged, but our, and so we'd ha we did do correspondence regarding that, but uh, we kind of ran out of steam, mm -hmm. I think, and we felt that it was happening, like made was available. David, you, yeah, if anyone has something else to offer. Go to the mic. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> the active chapter ceased functioning as such, but what a few of us did was provided um, witness services. Quite often people had to get their forms witnessed by a third party or someone who's not interested in their will and so forth. And so we provided that and on many occasions I went off to various houses and spoke to somebody and then was prepared to sign the document. Then the COVID pandemic crept in and uh, we never really came together afterwards. So I think it, petered out slowly. There we are. The chapter, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the well, very thoughtful questions. Thank you, everyone, for participating in such a meaningful way. And Tanya, thank you so much. I don't, I don't remember a standing ovation. <laughs> So hopefully we'll see everyone back next week, Wednesday, Wednesday next week.